All right, thanks, Jeff. As Jeff said, I'm Troy Brick. Um, they asked me to give a talk about the future of antibiotic use in cattle, and I think I should start by saying I don't know for sure what specifically is going to happen in the future. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is there's going to be a lot of background information. I'm going to cover a lot of the rules and recommend or reckon, excuse me, rules and regulations that have been in place for quite a few years and talk about why it should matter and then a little bit about where I think this antibiotic thing is going to go. So first of all, you need to know that the FDA is responsible for the regulations of all human and animal drugs in the U.S. As far as veterinary drugs go, the laws are very similar to the laws that are in place for human drugs. A couple of differences, but for the most part, they're the same. Um, all the regulations, you know, you can't go in, the doctor gives you a prescription, um, you're not supposed to share it with somebody else. That is illegal. Um, the FDA's number one concern is a safe food supply and the safety of the consumer. Uh, and like I said before, with a few exceptions, which I'll mention as they come up, these rules and regulations have not changed for quite a while. Uh, what has changed over the last couple of years is the monitoring and enforcement of these rules. The FDA monitors and has been stepping up enforcement over the last couple of years. Why does it really matter? Because right now there's an onslaught out there. Reuters just ran a three uh, story series on how we as producers and veterinarians are making a dangerous situation for the human consumer. I don't expect you to be able to read this whole slide, but you can go to Reuters.com and look up this report. And then, like I said, it was three articles. And basically what this, this particular article states is that Ceftiafur, which is Naxel, Exceed, and XNL, is one of the most potent antibiotics used by the U.S. cattle industry, including dairy farmers. The key component is the, is the top-selling line of drugs for Zoetis, the world's largest animal health company, formerly known as Pfizer. Um, many of the statements in here uh, are, are there just to put fear into the public. Uh, one of the statements, and I quote, is, but the strength of the antibiotic cephalofur and the frequency for which it is being misused on farms across America has created a threat to human health that may overshadow the drug's effectiveness. Um, and, it sh and they go on to say that this is proven by an examination by Reuters. They also state that cephalofur residues are not themselves considered to be dangerous to people. And which is true because the FDA sets those levels that can go through in milk and meat at a pretty low level, and they monitor those. But because the government sets those standards low, the perils come from us creating resistance in the microorganisms that might be there. And now the antibiotic, which Ceftiafur is a human antibiotic, now the antibiotic won't work if people get those infections. And I can tell you that there's a lot of research out there that refutes that. Um, despite these perils, Reuters states, there are economic incentives to misuse ceftiafur. It states, and I quote, the potent drug can keep a sick cow alive long enough for the dairy farmer to sell the animal to a slaughterhouse. And then they quote a dairy farmer from Kentucky. Uh, it states that this gentleman had a, his farm tested positive for 5.61 milligrams of ceftiafur residue per kilogram of tissue sampled. That was 14, higher, 14 times higher than the level of 0 0.4 milligrams per kilogram that it was set by the FDA. And when they asked the gentleman, he said, we're talking about our livelihood, our money. We're trying to save a cow, and if we can't save the cow, we're trying to salvage it. In other words, send her to the stockyard and get something out of it so that there's temptation and Reuters says, so that this all leads to us as producers being tempted to fudge on the use of the antibiotics. Um, these kind of statements, and the statement by the, by the producer doesn't help the situation at all. So let's just go into what some of the FDA regulations are. As I mentioned earlier, the FDA is responsible for the approval and labeling of all human and animal drugs. The FDA performs drug residue testings through the Food Inspection Service, or USDA, um, on all food products 
uh, milk, meat, and the such. The FDA also passes down the penalties for violation of improper drug use, and that's if they leave, lead to a volatile drug residue. And as I said earlier, the number one concern of the FDA is drug use in animals. It must, the, the, the drug use must not result in a vi violative drug residue. And if it does, um, like I said earlier, they are going, they are starting to penalize a little bit more and they're testing more. They're also doing some background testing just to check residues to see what's kind of floating around out there. So what's our responsibility as producers and veterinarians? When we read a, a drug, and I'm going to go through this a little bit more, all drug labels or all drugs, all bottles, if you take a bottle of penicillin, there's a label on that drug that explains their lawful use. And until 1996, it was illegal for anyone, even a veterinarian, to use any drug in a way that was not explicitly described on that label. In 1996, they passed, Congress passed the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act. We call it AMDUCA. This regulation allowed veterinarians to use some drugs, and I repeat, some drugs, in an extra-label manner. When we talk about extra-label drug use, we usually, if you're reading any literature, we, we, we use the acronym ELDU, and that's extra-label drug use. Extra-label drug use can be prescribed by a veterinarian when the health and well-being of an animal or group of animals is at stake, as long as certain conditions are met. So what are the conditions? Again, hopefully you can read this slide, but extra label drug use is permitted only or under the supervision of a veterinarian. Extra label drug use is allowed for FDA approved animal and human drugs only. This one's really important, and I'm going to cover this in a little bit as well, but you must have a valid veterinarian client patient relationship. It's not only a prerequisite for all extra-label drug use, but it's a prerequisite for any prescription medication. Uh, this, in the past, had just kind of been an oral agreement that, hey, I'm your veterinarian, this is what I prescribe for that animal. Because of a lot of the, the prosecution and the way the FDA is looking into things, this has now turned into what's going to be a written agreement and it is going around most states, and I will show you Ohio's version here in a minute. Um, as it's the, the next point states, most states are now en enacting written DCPRs. Um, extra label drug use for therapeutic uses only. The animal's health is suffering or is threatened. Extra label drug use is not allowed for production purposes, and you can't use a drug that's not approved because it's less expensive. That is not a reason for extra label drug use. Rules, these rules apply to all parenteral or injected drugs and also drugs administered in the water. Extra label drug use of feed grade medications are strictly prohibited, meaning it's illegal. If you put, if you mix oreomycin into the feed and it's at a level that's not written on the label, it's higher than that, it's illegal. You just broke the law, the FDA could arrest you and fine you. Extra label drug use is not permit, permitted if it results in a volatile food residue or any residue which may present a risk to the public health. So if you use a drug extra labely, the meat and milk withdrawal times must be extended. And the FDA prohibits some, some drugs from extra label drug use. And there are some drugs that are, that are illegal to use in food animals as a whole. So I mentioned the VCPR. So what is the VCPR? And this, this wording has been around for a long time. I said now we're just getting ready to start putting it into writing and have producers are going to have to have a veterinarian involved um, people that aren't used to having veterinarians are going to have to have a veterinarian involved to, to do almost anything with drugs in the future and in the not too distant future. So the BCPR states that the veterinarian has assumed responsibility um, for making the clinical judgments regarding the health of the animals. 
basically it's an agreement between the veterinarian and the client that states that the veterinarian, veterinarian will take responsibility for the health and well-being of those animals and the client agrees to follow the veterinary instructions. The veterinarian, in order for this to happen, the veterinarian must know the herd, and that includes the animals and the management situation. And they must know that herd well enough to make recommendations, and they must make regular visits to the farm and, insert, and observe it and examine livestock. Uh, there, it's, it's not really written anywhere how often that visit has to be made. I know when I was in practice in Northwest Iowa, we had it, or we used uh, 30 day, 30 to 60 days, depending on the situation. A lot of our swine facilities were every 30 days we had to be there in order to write a prescription. Um, and the veterinarian must always be available to answer questions or make recommendations either the veterinarian or an agent for the veterinarian. All right, I just had a uh, question here or a note here that says there was some background noise. I'll try and figure out what that is. Um, hopefully it'll get better. Sorry about that. Um, this is what the Ohio veterinary client patient relationship agreement is going to look like. And basically what it's going to go through is all of the things uh, that I just covered and then the client or you as a producer will sign it and the veterinarian will sign it and this will be your veterinarian of record as far as the FDA is concerned so if they would if you would send uh, an animal to the slaughter plant they find a residue they're going to come back and they're going to question you and they're also going to question that veterinarian of record and hopefully everything is, and I'm going to go through some documentation and some other things that need to be kept in order to, you know, hopefully clear yourself. This veterinarian of record, and, and some, some producers have more than one veterinarian. They may have one veterinarian that does their embryo transfer work or their AI work. And so that has to be worked out between the client and all the veterinarians they have as to who's going to be the veterinarian of record and how they're going to spell it out. Uh, you can have more than one. Uh, I put this in there because I think it's a very important list. These are the drugs that are prohibited for extra label use in food animals, and in some case, in a lot of cases, uh, prohibited from from use in food animals. Uh, no questions asked. Chloramphenicol, clenbuterol, diethylstilbestrol, dimetredazole iprodonazole and nitrum well those first five are all illegal to use in food producing animals nitromidazoles and nitrofurazones are also illegal to use in food producing animals that furazone that you put on you're not supposed to do that if they come in if the FDA or USDA inspector comes into a dairy operation and sees a, a nitrofurazone ointment there they can write them up and they can potentially close them down um, some of the sulfa drugs, and this is a bigger deal in, in lactating dairy cattle, and this is because there's so many people out there with sulfa uh, uh, allergies. Fluoroquinolones, um, glycopeptides, bute or phenylbutazone. You cannot use it in female dairy cattle that are 20 months of age or older. Um, any of the neuroamidase inhibitors, uh, that are they're basically anti-influenza drugs they're pro prohibited especially in chickens and turkeys and there are special rules now for the safety affairs you can only use those as marked on the label the same thing with the fluoroquinolones which is Batril for those of you familiar with Batril um, so what's the process if, if, if I want to prescribe to you a drug to use extra labely? These are the questions I have to answer in my head. Uh, are the animals to be treated food animals? And in most cases, yes. Uh, it, even if they're a show animal or a pet goat, it's still a food animal. Is there a drug labeled for a food animal? So I need to look and make sure that there's a drug or if I want to use something extra labely, uh, I have to first 
decide if there's another drug that can be used that is labeled for a food animal. And that includes it has to have the right ingredients. I have to use it at the right dose. And um, the label indication and will it be effective. And then if I decide that, is that, can that drug, if, if I can't find that, is there a drug that's labeled for food animals that doesn't have one of these things but could still be used? Um, and then I have to go on, is there a drug for non-food animals that could be used? And then I can go to the human drugs. And then there's a whole other pile of regula regulations if I want to mix my own drug, which we call compounding. It's important to remember that the prohibited drugs that I mentioned earlier are prohibited for everything, even extra label drug use. And feed additives cannot be used in any way that is not written on the label. All right, so I just threw a couple examples in here. And you'll notice as I go through my examples, I used penicillin G, I used banamine, and I used LA200. And I chose those because those are the highest. Those, those are the, the drugs that have the highest volatile residues found when the inspectors are inspecting, and so by USDA and, and FDA. So if we look at this penicillin bottle and we read that tiny fine print, which you probably need a micro, uh, magnifying glass to see, you look at it and you'll see that the dose is 3,000 international units per pound of body weight, which means nothing to most people. It equates to one cc per 100 pounds of body weight. I do not know very many people that use it at one cc per 100 pounds of body weight. Most people use it at a much higher dose than that. If you do, it's extra label. You, as a producer, cannot make that decision on your own. You have to have veterinary approval to make that decision. Um, so we talked about dose. Indications. So on the label it states that it's there to treat bacterial pneumonia and only bacterial pneumonia caused by Pasteurella multocida in cattle and sheep. It, it, and again, I should preface this by saying this is one bottle of penicillin. Different manufacturers have slightly different labels, so every bottle should be read. You'll notice that some of the doses can be a little bit different, and the most important thing is some of the withdrawal periods can be slightly different based on which bottle you're looking at. Um, so as you can see, these are the indications uh, that we can use this specific penicillin for. How can we administer it? We can give it intramuscularly only. And then if you follow BQA guidelines, we're going to give it in the neck. And we should give no more than 10 cc's per injection site. Duration of treatment. All right, so the bottle says that you should treat no more than four consecutive days. And then it lists the withdrawal periods. So when we look at that dose, indication, route, or duration of treatment, if we change any one of those, by any amount, it is an extra label use of that drug and has to be okayed by the veterinarian. And the veterinarian actually has to write it out as the prescription. And then you have to keep records, which I'm going to tell you what you have to keep for records in a minute. Next example, LA200 or oxytetracycline. Some of the generics, they could be biomycin 200. There's various names on the label. Typically, it's about 3 cc's per 100 pounds of body weight. Um, and there's two doses on this bottle. There's a bigger dose and a smaller dose. Basically, we can go through the indications again. You can use this drug for pneumonia or shipping fever that's caused by Pasteurella or Histophilus. You can use it for pink eye if it's more axella bovis. Uh, one of the things we look at is this indication. How do we know that? How do you know that it's a Pasteurella or Histophilus? What if it's a mycoplasma? Can you use this? Well, technically, if it's a mycoplasma pneumonia, you're using it off-label. So you have to have veterinary approval. A foot rot and diphtheria caused by Fusobacterium necrophorum. Again, you look through the indications. Route. So on this bottle, you can use it subcutaneously or intravenously. If you give this drug in the muscle, then you're using it extra-label. 
uh, again, we, we look at the duration of treatment. You should not exceed four days with the smaller dose. Um, you should only use one treatment with the bigger dose. So that's the three cc's per 100 pounds of this drug, and that usually lasts about, we usually say, 48 hours, but it's a single treatment. There is nothing on this label that says you can give a second dose without talking to the veterinarian. And then you have your withdrawal periods. And again, if you give that second dose, this withdrawal period has to be extended some, in some cases, depending on the dose. This one, banamine, or flinix and megalamine, which a lot of the generics just may say flinix or flinix and megalamine. Um, so again, we look at the dose. But the biggest one on this, so you can, you can read through these doses and these indications. And if you look, the only indications on this bottle are for fever. That's what pyrexia means. Fever associated with bovine respiratory disease or fever associated with endotoxemia or inflammation associated with endotoxemia. The big one here is the only route of administration that is approved for banamine is the IV route. And that's where a lot of people get stuck. This penicillin has the number one volatile residue of any of the drugs. Number two is banamine. And they've discovered that the reason for that is because it's given sub-QRIM, and the withdrawal time needs to be extended a lot longer. I mentioned compounding earlier. And compounding is where you take a drug, or you take two drugs and you mix them together. One of the big ones when I was in swine medicine was to take, uh, if you had um, pigs that had uh, ascaris or some or worms that were causing some pneumonia, so some migrating worms, you would mix the LA-200 with maybe some ivermectin and inject it that way. Uh, it's all right to do that if you use two drugs that are approved and the veterinarian does it. You can't do that at home and put them in the same syringe to give one easy injection unless it's okayed and you get written instructions from your veterinarian. Um, the next little bullet there talks about extra label drug use does, is not, does not allow for compounding from bulk drugs, meaning that I cannot order a big wad of a, a keg of tetracycline from China and get it in and then make my own oxytetracycline 200. That is very much illegal. Uh, I mentioned the veterinary feed directive, or I mentioned medicated feeds earlier. According to the FDA, the, this, these what I have there, four things are the only combinations that are approved. So they're the only mix that you can use. They're the only thing that combination that you can mix in a feed uh, that would be approved by the FDA. And you cannot go off-label on the dose or what it is used for, so that indication. This bottom point says AMPM feeding is not approved. What that means is if you want to use, say, uh, rumensin in the morning and then give them oreomycin in the afternoon, as you can see, that combination is not in that list above. If you gave the rumensin in the morning and the oreomycin in the afternoon, that is considered a combination feeding. It cannot be done. That is illegal. Um, so this is one of those areas that's changing right now. The FDA has proposed changing the law related to the veterinary feed directive to remove the words for production purposes. It means any Antibiotic, that's a feed-grade antibiotic, will no longer be able to use for production purposes, meaning growth promotion, typically. Um, so they were going through their question and answer period, and during that period, uh, all of the producers or the, 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 the manufacturers of those products agreed to remove the statement for production purposes from the labels of all food-grade antibiotics. So since it will be removed from the label, it will now be illegal. So the only thing that you will be able to use uh, food-grade antibiotics for is the treatment. And in some cases, there's still debate on the prevention of disease, whether that wording is going to be taken out or not. 
All right, I mentioned the records. So if, if we use a drug in an extra label manner, and I would recommend that you keep these kind of records for any animal that is treated. You need to have the animal ID or the group of animals ID'd, and you need to be, if an FDA inspector comes on your place, you need to be able to point out those animals to them, every animal that was treated, so that if they test um, an animal that you did not point out to them and it comes up with residues, uh, there could be a problem. You need to keep track of the species, how many animals were treated, the conditions that you treated for, you have to use the name of the drug. So in our earlier example, if it was LA200, you have to write down LA200 and the active ingredient being oxytetracycline. How much you used, so the prescribed dose and how you gave it, how long you were treated, and what the withdrawing withdrawal period is. And then you need to keep those records for two years if it's an extra label drug use. Uh, the veterinarian has to keep those. I believe it's a five-year requirement. Um, this is what I, when, when I give you a drug and I've prescribed a drug to you, this, uh, these are all the things that should be written on that label. It should, have your, it should have my name and address on it. It should really also have your name or the farm name on it and probably the address as well. It should have the common name of the drug. So again, if it's LA200, it should have the name LA200. It should also have the oxytetracycline name on there. I should give you explicit directions for use, including what animals you're going to use it in. Uh, whether it's a, if I give you a single dose of something, it's going to say the animal's tag number. In a lot of cases, uh, in a beef operation or so let's say a feedlot operation, uh, I may prescribe some drugs for the treatment or prevention of respiratory disease, I can say for the feeder animals. Uh, I'm going to also have to have on there the dosage frequency and how you should give that drug and how long you should give it. Uh, any meat and milk withdrawals or anything, any other things that you should be cautious about. Um, as we mentioned before, the most important thing is to reduce the amount of volatile residues that go into the feed supply or that the USDA inspectors come up with. So make sure that you know all of the animals that have been treated. Keep tag numbers, mark them somehow. Make sure you follow label instructions. Uh, if you have two antibiotics and one of them, and you've used, let's say it's two different bottles of penicillin. I've seen bottles of penicillin that have a 14-day meat withdrawal and one that has a 16-day meat withdrawal. Same ingredients, everything, different manufacturers. Let's say you've used those on a group of cattle and you're not sure which one you put into each into the animal, choose the longer withdrawal time. If you have a choice between intramuscular injection and sub-Q injection, use the sub-Q. Uh, it follows BQA guidelines, and it, um, the absorption is going to be a little bit different. If you're given multiple antibiotics at the same time, that's going to change the profile of the elimination or it's going to extend the withdrawal time. And again, make sure that if drugs are used extra labelly, um, they can they will uh, that you extend the withdrawal time. There was just a question from I think that's Crawford County. Can the FDA inspector come on your farm at any time? I think they have to get permission from you the way that I understand it. Uh, if you say yes, you can come on, then they can come on. Um, otherwise, they have to have a warrant just like anybody else. Uh, if they have a reason to suspect that you have volatile residues, uh, I think the way it looks, they can pretty easily get the warrant. It might not be right away. The other thing that they'll do is if they weren't going to come on with a warrant or something is uh, they can just wait for you to, to, to slaughter the animal. Uh, because there's some drugs that that never get eliminated, they get eliminated below the, the threshold level. Or I shouldn't say never, but it takes a long, long time for them to be eliminated. This is a thing that the Ohio Veterinary Medical Association put out. It actually comes through the uh, Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Association, and it's a HACCP, or a Hazard Analysis and Critical con Control Points handout to give to producers to help them to figure out how we're going to reduce this res residue problem. 
Uh, and as it says on there, residues are not a problem with the drug. It's a problem with the way that they were injected or mixed or whatever else. Mostly injected, not mixed. I shouldn't say that. But, um, or the way that they were used. That's probably a better way to put it. Uh, I have some, I can get copies of these handouts if you want them. The other thing I wanted to mention earlier, if you ever have questions on the first slide, uh, my office phone number is there, leave a message, or you can email me. Email is probably the best way, but if you're interested in this, I can get it to you. It has some pretty good information. You can also go to um, the University of Wisconsin, or the, excuse me, the uh, uh, Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Association website, and you can get some of this information off of there as well. Uh, another question from Crawford County. Do you ever s foresee a time that only veterinarians can give the treatments? Uh, I do. I don't know when it's going to come. Uh, if you look at the way most of the countries in the e EU do things, the way that I understand it, and I have worked with people from uh, different countries in the EU, that's the way it is over there. And I think at some point for the export market, we're going to have to have almost uh, a one type of health care to get by with being able to export. I think it will come around. I think it, it's a long time coming. I think they've got a lot of other issues to deal with first. I, what I see happening before that is the removal of over-the-counter medicines like penicillin and LA-200. You won't be able to walk into Tractor Supply and buy a bottle anymore. And that's kind of... so. You know, I'm hoping that that generates some questions on the antibiotic use. And like I said, I wanted to give kind of a background. And as I said, all these regulations have been there. Uh, we just haven't, you know, followed them to the letter of the law, I guess, for a long time. And now that all this publicity is out there, something's going to have to be done. And I think the way that most of us as producers and veterinarians and veterinary organizations and producer organizations look at it is we should clean up our act and start policing ourselves and do things right before the government comes in and tells us how we're going to have to do it. It's always better if we can do it ourselves and show them that we're responsible rather than have them make it. We have enough laws the way it is. We don't need them making any more. Um, and then, so for the end of this presentation, I just wanted to put a couple of things. Calving time's here or right around the corner. So I wanted to put in just some things to remember. Uh, think about scours. If you haven't vaccinated the cows, then you might want to vaccinate the calves when they hit the grounds. It's, there's oral vaccines. The most important thing with these scour vaccines is look at the label. The scour vaccines for cows have very specific time frames in when those vaccines should be given. And why is that important? It's important so that those antibodies that the cow produces when you give that vaccine get into the colostrum. The colostrum is made approximately four weeks before the calf is born. So we need to get vaccine into the cows. We need to get the antibodies made. And it has to be, they have to be made before the colostrum is produced for it to get into the calves, basically. Um, make sure all your equipments, equipments together, calf jacks, tube feeders, all that stuff, make sure it works well. Know where it is. Uh, it's the worst time to be looking for it is when the emergency has hit. Uh, when the calf is born, I say this even if you know your cows, be careful. Cows can be protective of newborns. Uh, some of those cows, you know, they, they change on a dime. Make sure you dip the calf's navel with 7% iodine. Make sure you completely cover it, and it should be covered and, and dipped for 10 to 15 seconds. Doing it a second time a couple hours later isn't a bad idea. Uh, if you're going to give scour vaccines to the calf, make sure that you read the labels. Some of them say that you should give it before colostrum. Some of them say that you should give it, that it doesn't matter. Uh, but you need to give it before, say, 12 hours of age. So make sure you understand what those say and what they mean. Um, ID your calf. If you're going to put ear tags in, make sure that there's some free air space around the tag. Uh, it, it helps it heal better and we have less ear abscesses. If you're going to tattoo the individual calf, put the ID number in the upper rib of the right ear as a 
and probably the opposite, the non-tagged ear, but that middle rib of the right ear, um, and it doesn't I mean, you can tattoo the left ear if you want, but that middle rib of the right ear for females that are going to be brucellosis vaccinated, that's where we have to put the brucellosis tattoo. So we want to avoid that middle rib space of the right ear when you look inside the ear. And I see there's a few more questions. I'm going to get to the end of this, and then we'll just have a question and answer session. I'm not ignoring you, I guess is my point. Um, I put this map in here to show you that we are deficient in selenium. So giving a, a BOC injection in the neck at birth isn't a bad idea. About two cc's should cover um, most of the animals born. I gave each type of selenium and vitamin E that you can, well, three of the types that you can buy and the dose range that you can give. Remember, just because a little is good, a lot isn't better. You can cause problems if you overdose them. You can cause toxicities. So that's why I wanted to make sure that you had these doses. Uh, you want to make sure that your calf's standing within about 30 minutes and that it nurses around an hour of birth. If this doesn't occur, make sure you watch it close. We want to get that first bit of colostrum into that calf by six hours of age for sure. And we need to absolutely make sure we get it in there prior to 12 hours of age. And the reason from this, this is, or the reason for this, this is the most important step in the life of that animal. Unlike humans, cattle do not get any immune protection from the dam. None of that crosses the placenta. It all has to come in colostrum. And as soon as that calf takes in any protein orally, so basically as soon as it hits the ground and starts swallowing stuff, the cells that help transport those immunoglobulins across the stomach into the system start to close off. And at 12 hours of age, more, a little bit more than half of those are closed off. And at 24 hours of age, after 24 hours of age, if that animal has not had colostrum, giving a colostrum will do nothing for it except give it some nutrition. It will do nothing for the immune system. So that's why it's the most important step in the life of that animal. Not just of that calf, but of that animal. It sets it up for the rest of its life. It's best to use fresh float, frozen colostrum, hopefully from a well-vaccinated cow and one that you know the disease status on. Make sure that you understand that there are colostrum replacers and colostrum supplements. If you do not, if you're not sure that calf got colostrum, give it a colostrum replacer, replacer and feed it as directed on the package. That means mix it exactly like it says. You can cause some electrolyte imbalances and some pH problems if they're not mixed correctly. Um, and I gave you kind of some guidelines on feeding the uh, fresh colostrum. And then the most important thing is probably keeping really good records. Um, I heard John mention something about not having a, a sharp pencil or something. So make sure that you have something. This calf book right here is waterproof. I believe you write in it with pencil, if I remember correctly. And you can take it out there with you, and it does a pretty good job. I've used them before. But these are the things that you really kind of want to know. You want to know the birth date, the weight, the sex. Um, it, right, you can write in that tag number right there. Uh, if you EID the tag calves right then and there, you can write that in there as well and then ID the dam. And I think that's about it for the presentation. Um, I'll look through some of these questions, and boy, there was a lot of them there, I think. Okay, so um, there's a question that says, since Bovitec and Remensen are considered antibiotics, how will it affect the future of their use? That's a good question. I don't think that that has been decided yet. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about it, but the way it looks, and, and from the veterinary side of things, I don't think that they're antibiotics. They're considered ionophores. Uh, they're in their, their coccidiostats so that they, um, they can help you reduce coccidiosis, and they do also help with production. But the main reason that they were developed when they were developed was a, as ionophores. And the way that I have seen it to this point in uh, different listservs and people talking is I don't, 
we do not believe that they're going to be affected, at least not right now. And, and the other reason for that is there are no human products out there that are similar or in nothing similar that we use in humans for, to, to fight infection. Next question, when do producers need written directions on drugs from a vet? Anytime it's a prescription drug. Uh, I just took uh, an order to one of our dairies today and I printed individual labels for every bottle and they had a big order. Um, and so as the veterinarian of record for that dairy, I put our name, which is Ohio Department of Veterinary Medicine, or Ohio Department of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, my name's on there, our address is on there, our phone number's on there, what they are to use that for, what the dose is for, all those things that were listed on that slide I showed you, I had to make sure were on that label. Uh, and so any prescription drug should have a label like that. Now, if you look at this HACCP that I showed you, there's some stuff on there. They talk about um, drug protocols. So it's okay for the veterinarian to write a protocol for a common condition. So I, uh, let's go back to the feedlot again. Uh, bovine respiratory disease in feedlot animals is, is a pretty common condition. And so for our feedlots, uh, I have protocols written up and, and, and on that protocol, I have to s spell out what they're going to see, how they're going to diagnose the disease, and then I give them, I gave them, I think, three different treatments to start with. So they're going to do that treatment, and, if, and then I have to give them a period of time that if they do not notice an improvement, they need to call me, and then I need to come and look at the animal, and we need to move on from there. But So protocols are all right, and standard operating rating yeah, I can't talk. Standard operating procedures are okay as well. Uh, a good example on a dairy might be a milk fever. How am I going to treat a milk fever? And I could write up a protocol because that's a pretty common condition. Um, so those kinds of things you can do. And on that protocol, it will have the drug and the dose. And so the drug the indication, the dose, and the route of in, uh, administration all on there. And that can be all right. But that drug should still have a label on it. Or it could say on the protocol, use as directed by the label. Let's see, question, what about vaccine withdraws? I'm not quite sure where that question is going either, if that's related to, um, can you use them? Vaccines aren't considered prescription drugs. So if the question is about prescription drugs and vaccines, they're not considered prescription drugs. You still should be able to order those. Uh, through your catalogs. As far as vaccines withdrawals, I like vaccines withdrawals if I'm going to vaccinate a bunch of animals. Uh, if it's a killed vaccine, then I can save that for later as well. Uh, shelf life of frozen colostrum, if it's frozen, it's supposed to be about a year. Remember when you take that frozen colostrum out, do not overheat it. If you overheat it, you break down the antibody or yeah, the antibodies, and or, and now it doesn't do us any good because you break down that protein. Uh, the best way to thaw that colostrum is to uh, I I put it in a bucket in a sink, and I run tepid water into the bucket and just let it overflow the bucket. It wastes a little bit of water, but it it warm it thaws that colostrum pretty slow. The question, next question is, if you have a feed ration with Bovitec and Oreomycin, and then you also feed Decox and Oreomycin and another feed ration to the same set of cattle, does that mean, yes, it, 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 I didn't finish the question, sorry, does that mean the producer is in violation? Um, if you're doing it the same day, yes. Now, if you run your Bovitec Oreomycin uh, for this, a set period of time and stop and then start the decox and the oreomycin for a set period of time, you should be all right. Now remember, um, oreomycin will not be labeled for production purposes. And if you read that, that means for treatment of anything or prevention, the maximum you can go is like four to five grams per head per day. And I believe that's five to seven days, and then you have to pull it out. Uh, so that will be the limit. 
you won't be able to feed it for the whole feeding period, and especially not at those half-dose levels. Uh, that's what I'm assuming. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what the label really, really looks like when it comes out. Uh, Multi-min. Uh, the question is, use of multi-min for supplementing. Um, I've seen it used. I've used it in some places. There is some research that says that some of those minerals um, are not available. There's some research that says it does fine. It all depends on what you look at the research for. What I tell my producers is, if it makes you feel better, I guess it makes me feel better. It's, it's, it's kind of expensive just to, to be a feel-good drug, uh, from what I remember. But there, are, there is some pretty good research out there that shows that some of those vitamins and minerals don't always get utilized by the animal. Uh, does the multi-min have any of the selenium benefits of BOC? I don't know how much selenium's in there, so I can't answer that. I'd have to look at, at the, I, well, I can't remember. Um, so I, I'd have to look at the label to be able to tell you. Is the drug problem more in dairy herds than beef? They didn't break it up like that. They looked at milk residues and meat residues. We don't really know. See, the FDA, USDA does kind of a sentinel uh, residue thing every year. And then at the end of the year, they print out the residues and the violations. And so they don't really break it down into the breed that came through. They just test the meat because it's supposed to be random. They don't want to have the ability to be able to trace it back to somebody because it's, it's a random test. They just go take samples. So they, they have it broken down into meat and milk. So I don't know that I can answer that question. Uh, I know that it's been proposed that we're seeing more problems in the beef animals that, go, or excuse me, in dairy animals that are slaughtered for beef. But I don't know that that's proven or not. I can't answer that. Okay, next question. Medicated feed for one problem and feeding medicated feed for another problem. Does this put the producer in violation? If there is a mixture, if there's any type of mixture that is not on that slide I showed you, yes, it puts you in violation. So if you're feeding... I think it was what Romensin couldn't be Romensin couldn't be fed with oreomycin, if I remember right on that slide. Um, if you're if 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 you're getting Romensin in your feed and you're feeding oreomycin separate, yes, you would be in violation. And the FDA is very very specific on no 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 extra label use of feed grade medications. Next question. Oreo for anaplasmosis and rumensin for coccidiosis not permitted at the same time. Let's see, Oreo for anaplasmosis and rumensin for coccidiosis. Correct. You could not add both of those together. Does colostrum provide protection against black leg? What about vaccinating at birth? Okay, so really anything that the cow's vaccinated for. If it gets into the colostrum and she's making antibodies for it, the calf should have some protect protection. Now, how long is that protection? Uh, in some cases, it's not really, really long. Uh, we also, and when we start talking about vaccinations, we also can run into another problem called maternity, maternal antibody interference. And so with some disease processes, um, if we vaccinate them at birth, and there's maternal antibodies in that colostrum, that vaccination will not do its job because the maternal antibodies are blocking it from making more antibodies. If that makes, that, that's a very simplistic way of putting it, but if that, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so, but what about black, vaccinating for black leg at birth? Uh, I usually wait a couple, few weeks, a couple weeks, um, I think it really depends on if you've had a problem. If you've had a problem with bat black leg, I would say vaccinate them. There seems to be a window at about three weeks of age where no vaccines work very well. I would avoid vaccinating anything at around right at about that three week of age. Actually, it's about three to six weeks, depending on where you look in the literature. 
but before that and after that can be good. So if you've had a problem with black, black leg, the vaccine works very, very well. Uh, I would vaccinate them. But it's important to get a booster vaccine in them about two to three weeks after. AS700 at the same time as Bovateca rumensin. Again, if it's not on this list, this list came from the FDA website. So those four things are the only approved combinations. Uh, if you want more information, you can go to their website and look, but I did, that's where I pulled these combinations from. Now, is that going to change in the future? I don't expect it to because the push really was to pull all medicated feed, feed grade antibiotics off the market altogether. So that would have pulled your oreomycin, your Thailand, um, those things would have been pulled away totally. So I really don't think they're going to approve any more combinations. But you know what? The FDA kind of does what it, what, it, what it wants to do. We talked about fluoroquinolones being Batril, and they are illegal to use extra labeling. And one of the problems that they've always said that they've had is using it on scouring calves. Well, lo and behold, they're getting ready to put out a label for pig scours, which makes no sense at all to me. So they do things that don't make sense sometimes. Question, you mentioned enforcement of antibiotic use on farms. Do you see inspections being enforced in the next few years? Um, I think the way that this is going to work out, they don't have enough people to send to all these farms. But what you're going to see is you're going to see more, I think, residue testing. And so they'll test at the slaughter plants or at the dairies. And when they come up with a residue, then they'll backtrack it to the farm. And that's what you'll see. You're not going to see just somebody coming on the farm. Although uh, dairy farms get inspected by USDA or, well, you know, it's usually a state inspection. So ODA, periodically, they come in and they look in the drug cabinets. And if there's a drug that's not supposed to be in there, they get written up. Uh, and then it depends on... You know, if they get how often they get written up. If they haven't had any residues or anything, um, they'll get written up. Uh, but you, you know, you know uh, when we have dairy farms and beef farms, and we cannot have some of our beef drugs in dairy farms. A good example is New Floor or Resfloor Gold or New Floor Gold. Those are not to be used in cattle greater than 20 months of age. So we cannot keep them on our dairy at all, even though there's dairy calves there. They have to be kept separate. They have to be kept at the beef farms. Even if the beef farm and dairy farm are on the same property, they have two different refriger or two different cabinets, one for beef, one for dairy. What date does the new feed additive label go into effect? I don't know that that's 100% decided yet. Last I saw, there was not a decision. It was just basically going to phase in, and I would look at any feed if you buy a bag of Oreomycin, read the label. Because I, the way I understood it, they were going to phase it in as, as they started producing new product. And like I said before, it's always been, the law has always said you have to do, with feed grade antibiotics, there is absolutely no extra label use. Only can be used as it says on the label. So, um, that's the best I can tell you on that. Um, a comment here. Uh, Alpha-7 works in the face of maternal antibodies. Many producers give it at birth if they have had a problem. It's less than 50 cents a dose, and it saves one. It's well worth it. If given at birth, it does need to be given again after three months of age in your preconditioning program. I agree. And like I said before, if you're having a problem, I would give it early. I've seen it stop black leg pretty, pretty, pretty quick. Um, another comment, uh, is vaccinating for brucellosis required for beef and dairy cattle? It is no longer required. The U.S., all, every state is considered brucellosis free, last I checked. It, the only area that we're concerned about is that area around Yellowstone National Park where the bison um, and some of the elk, have, we think some of the elk, but the bison for sure have, have brucellosis. Um, it is no longer required, but if you sell cattle, some of the sales require it to be done, or at least testing. It's much easier to vaccinate than it is to test. Uh, in the state of Ohio, you have to vaccinate 
the vaccination given to dairy and beef heifers, there's different time frames. Uh, you have a little bit longer, and I can't remember the exact date anymore, for beef animals than you do for dairy. Dairy animals, very specific. It has to be given no earlier than, and they put it in days, but it's basically no earlier than four months of age and no later than six months of age. If you look at the, uh, the USDA regulations, uh, they state that it has to be done before they're a year of age. After that, you can't vaccinate for brucellosis. But every state has changed that a little bit. When I was in Iowa, uh, if I remember correctly, it was 10 months of age. I think South Dakota was 11 months of age. Um, Ohio is, like I said, for dairy cattle, it's between uh, four and six months of age. And I believe, and I'd have to check, but I believe the beef cattle is up to uh, eight months. I think I hit all the questions. I don't see anybody still typing. I think you did too. And I know last year when you made the offer for people to email you questions, you spent a lot of time answering those. So um, the offer again, Dr. Rick. Oh, no problem. I, you know, it's it, emails are nice because I can read them and I can hopefully answer the question right away. Um, I did get a couple of phone calls last year. Also, the only problem, and especially right now. I'm handling things by myself for the next couple weeks, so I'm running around a lot. I'm not always by the phone. But if you leave a voicemail, I'll try and get back to you. It's still best if you, if you can email me. You can email me. Uh, if you have other questions about vaccinations, um, I'd be more than happy to answer those as well.